But how are you guys holding up? Let's, let's check the energy of the room. Are you guys still alive? Survived the day of make it? Yeah, yeah good energy. I like to have energy in the room whenever I'm uh, demoing and teaching things. And uh, I know we're at the end of the day, but we're going to try to hold together for one last bit, cover a lot of good stuff, and uh, hopefully we haven't melted your brains throughout the day with, with too much knowledge and information. I've got to pop my head in throughout the day. It looks like there's been some really good sessions. Uh, just as a reminder, if you're tweeting or doing any of the social media, the hashtag is make it a pack. Uh, so if you want to say weird yank on stage, you're going to fall asleep now. No, don't do that. But if you do want to tweet or anything about it, you can uh, use that hashtag. So I just want to take a chance to introduce myself. My name is Mark Heaps. You can follow me online under the name at Life by Pixels. Um, I am the executive director of an agency that was formed and founded by my wife. She's the smart one. And I work for her, not as just the husband, but also as an employee. So I do everything, she says. <laughs> um, I'm also the owner of ATX Photo and Video Studio in Austin, Texas. I know what you're thinking about Texas. We'll just leave that alone. All right. And uh, most importantly, husband and dad and also ACE, ACP. So Adobe Certified Expert, Adobe Community Professional. Um, I've been doing this a really, really long time. Uh, I started in Photoshop 2. So not CS2, 2. I lived in San Jose, California at the time. I lived a couple of miles away from the Adobe headquarters, and I was in a pre-release program. This will tell you how long I've been doing this. They sent me a letter in the actual mail that said, part of the pre-release program, we'd like you to come down to our offices where we can show you a new feature. I got there, they fed us, they got us a little drunk, and said, look at layers. <laughs> been doing this a while. So yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's a major passion point for me. It's something that I love. Um, I speak at events. Uh, for Adobe and private events as well. And uh, basically, I'm here because I am a giant nerd. I love pixels and I love vectors and I love being amongst my people who also love pixels and vectors. I'm also a co-founder of a plugin for Lightroom for photographers in the room called uh, Reactive Exposure, which is a uh, plugin that speaks natively with Lightroom to autocorrect exposure. So if you're into photography, you might want to check that out. Um, it's a cool tool. That's as much promotion as I'll, uh, I'll do about selling anything. I'm also an author. Um, I've written for Scott Kelby's Photoshop User Magazine. I've also written for multiple Photoshop books as a contributor. Um, it's, it's definitely a passion point for me getting to, to share this kind of information. Um, but if anybody's ever seen me talk before, if you were at Adobe Max last year or any of the other events I spoke at, you'll know that the first thing I start all my talks with is pictures of my family because I try to remind myself why I do this and who it is that's actually giving up the time for me to spend time with everybody else. So for me, it's important to remember uh, who loves me and allows me to do this. So here we've got uh, Lincoln and Fiona, the Pikachu-obsessed Pokemon son of mine, and our, our princess, Tibby the dog. It's, uh, it's an interesting thing being a dad to these two. Uh, they've gotten to Taekwondo now, and I foresee some broken bones in the future, and we don't have uh, nationalized health care, so that's going to be a very expensive thing to experience. And that is my five-year-old doing yoga. Uh, he's very into that. So, uh, yeah, this is, this is one thing I'm very thankful for. And these are the people that allowed me to travel so far and come over and spend time with you guys. And sometimes that requires me dressing up as a six-foot-three Pikachu. Because <laughs> when your kid says, let's do a pokemon theme Halloween, you said, sure, not realizing what you were agreeing to. <laughs> All right, so I want to walk through some samples and kind of what this theme is today. We're going to talk a lot about... Uh, tips and tricks inside of Photoshop and Illustrator, um, some of the things that, that I've learned. And let me explain a little bit about how my sessions usually come about. So um, other than working for my wife's company, I've worked at uh, major agencies around the states. I also used to be a manager at Google. I've worked at Apple as a senior imaging expert. Um, I'm sponsored by Nikon, uh, although there's a Fuji camera on stage right now, so we'll just slide that back. Um, but ultimately what happens is throughout the year, I get called as a consultant by creative groups to say, hey, we're trying to make something. It's not working right. Could you come help us? Um, sometimes they're making things perfectly, but they're frustrated by the collaboration, the workflow, or maybe just the inefficiency of how they're working. So they say, hey, we've, we've established the style we want, right? Um, how many people here have an art director or someone that like manages their creative? Anybody? 
All right, yeah, quite a few of you, okay? So a lot of the time, people in those positions, they'll sort of design the styles and the treatments and then say, I made this one thing. It looks awesome. Now you go forth and replicate that a lot, right? And you have to repeat the process, but you got to find efficient ways to do it. That's usually where we get called in. So I document all of those processes, and then that's what I use to actually teach at these uh, conferences and workshops. So whether that's doing icons that, that we've created for clients like Ameritrade or, or Mission Motorcycles or even Apple, um, whether we're doing composite projects like this where the client will say, we love this, but everything's dead. Can you please put those together? Right, absolutely. Whether we're doing kind of an a animated piece for a presentation where they say, we want to we wanna show bridging the gap, right? It's sort of a metaphor in their presentation. They're about as good as those cliches where someone's throwing the dart at the dartboard or the hands shaking from the stock art that we all, the art director's client will give that to you and you're like, no, why? Cliches galore, right? But, you know, things like this where we'll, we'll actually do the color toning and matching, build them across as steps. These get animated during their presentations. Um, and sometimes it's trying to remember that occasionally, this maybe has happened to one of you guys, clients change their mind. <laughs> Once in a while, right? And sometimes it's your internal client. Maybe it's that art director. Maybe it's the boss. Maybe it's your manager. So when we come up with styles like this, and it has to be replicated across many concepts from a storyboard, one of the things that's really important is, how do I work as a production advocate? Right? How do I think with this idea that that's great that you came up with that style, but if they come back later and say, we don't like the word failure, that's negative. Can you do something not negative for us? You've got to be able to type in another word. And if you've rendered that out and rasterized it, I usually have to start from scratch. Right? So it's this idea of just having some production advocacy so that you're keeping your editability intact as much as possible. All right. Let's talk about a couple of specific projects that were, that were personal ones for me. This was an interesting one because I had to work with a, a vendor that does what's called water jet. You guys ever heard of water jet before? Yeah, it's a manufacturing um, uh, assembly sort of process. It's, it's a bit like laser cutting, but instead of using a laser, they actually use water at an extremely high velocity with sand in the water, and it actually can cut through steel or just about any material you put in front of it. So this was a project in San Francisco that I was hired for where they were opening an art gallery in a very, very dodgy part of San Francisco. Um, wouldn't want to walk around there at night. So the trend for this area was that people put bars over their windows and over their doors. Safety, security, makes sense. It's not very attractive, right? So they came to us and said, hey, we have some ideas. Can we do sort of a, a beautification or something interesting as a security component for the front of this building? So we started sketching our ideas, and that led to drawing this. So this is um, a little over 10,000 objects and points that because we were water jetting it, if you think about what we're talking about today, production advocacy and building something the right way, you couldn't have paths that would cross one another because now this high pressure water would come through and cut pieces of steel where they would just fall out of the design. So after this was all drawn, it had to be made into one object. That is all one seamless piece all the way through in the Illustrator file. This took me a couple of days, not much sleep, and at least one threat of divorce. <laughs> Thankfully, we have children. That makes it hard. All right, so from here, building this file out, it's a mandala, but there's some unique components in the mandala, like you can see the lunar elements around the circle. They're shifting in scale. Um, you can see the skulls and the butterflies and things are in a different pattern. But this led to us actually sending it to the plant where it was actually cut out in steel. Okay, this is um, about a centimeter thick. Okay, and eventually, this took, uh, took roughly four days to cut on the slow cutter. And eventually became the entrance of this gallery. Right? I didn't think about a couple of things because I think like a digital person. I also didn't think about how sharp those points were. The negative of this is after we got it all actually installed and put on the front of the gallery, uh, I did not ask that guy to roll by when I took this shot. <laughs> but he did, and I wasn't going to miss that opportunity. <laughs> I was like, you're awesome! <laughs> so you can imagine this thing uh, was very, very heavy. We had to then take that single piece and cut it into these panes for the windows and then mount that into all of the steel frame of the window panes, and then had to go back afterwards and grind down all the sharp points 
because suddenly the dad in me went, oh my God, the children, because they're going to cut themselves and hurt themselves on all these little sharp points. After we solved those problems, though, we sprayed it with a chemical wash. So if you were to see this in San Francisco today, it is very black at the top and very orangey green at the bottom. We spray it with chemicals so it'll have a natural patina gradient as it ages over time. What we didn't expect is to get a lot of tourists standing in front of it to take pictures just because, right? So these are some of the, the weird sort of projects that I get to build. This was another one that was a global project. Um, approach to work on this book. I was the production artist, designer on this book. And we wanted to showcase tattoos. I'm into tattoos, if you can't tell. And so when they approached me, they said, what's a good way to showcase full sleeve tattoos? And there was a 3D element to that, right? You turn the arm. How do we do that? We're not, we can't show 3D in print. So what's the right? You know? So we were inspired with the, uh, the sort of Da Vinci anatomy of man kind of concept, right? But how do we take that further? So this is having production advocacy in mind. Our photographer traveled all over the world. It was 17 countries. We shot tattoo pieces all around the globe, sometimes in flats, apartments, hotels, basements of nightclubs, you name it, we shot it. Sometimes we had black backdrops, sometimes we used towels. We had to take all of those variations and make it consistent throughout. So even before we got into the computer, we actually took a, a bunch of test shots where we figured out all the poses and positions with measurements and dots on a wall so that they could point their hand and know exactly how to turn it so that I was gonna composite it. Um, any photographers in the room? Yeah, a couple of you guys. So the interesting part about this is every picture, every piece of the arm you see there is actually two photographs. One is lit with the light, and as soon as the light would burst, we'd immediately take a second shot with no light. So I had an element where I could paint in the shadows from the dark part of the arm, and then the lit part of the arm would give me my highlights in the front. Okay, it was a lot, of, uh, a lot of masking, a lot of compositing. In the end, we did a series of poses. Thank you. And imagine trying to mask these in a way so it doesn't feel obtrusive when you're looking at the lines and how this was. It's really, really important to the tattoo artists. This turned into a very thick book, which was stitched and bound in Hong Kong, and then we took this on a gallery exhibit to four countries around the planet. Um, it ended up having a linen kind of rag cover that was pressed, and then a lenticular uh, decal put on so that as you moved the book, you could see the arms moving. And then later we actually, at the gallery exhibits, uh, projection mapped the arms opening as an animated piece. All of that had to be understood in advance, saying, what else are we doing? What else are we doing? Oh, you wanna make a movie? Oh, okay, I need to think about how I stack my layers. Oh, you wanna do a projection mapping? Okay, I need to make sure that I'm not using this technique, right? A big part of this is asking all the questions up front, right, and doing that preparation. This is the last sample I'll show you guys, and then we'll start diving into some techniques here. This was, just to give it some context, um, this was a very large project uh, that they gave us three months to do. Okay, so this is the Dell Children's Hospital in Austin, Texas. They host a gala every year to raise money for kids that are in the hospital whose families can't afford to pay for their treatment in the hospital. Okay, um, their goal was to try to raise uh, over a million dollars. They surpassed that goal. Um, what they do is they host this dinner event night and they take donors and sponsors that are at the event. The idea of a project like this is, you know, when you look at a finished piece, as designers, we can all look at it and go, oh, that's a beautiful campaign, but it's the sum of its parts. And even getting more granular into the sum of its parts is as rudimentary as how do you build it? Are you thinking about it the right way when you build it? So I'll let this play, I'll narrate over the top of it. Oh, someone's gonna call. <laughs> you owe me a beer, all right. Okay, so uh, these were the mood boards that I designed for the client. They asked for something atmospheric, interesting, ethereal, dreamlike. The, the event was actually called the Dream Gala. So I was pulling these from Behance and Google and all kinds of places and I, I just wanted to do this big board to see what resonated with the client. What offends you, what do you like, where are you leaning towards, I really need to calibrate with you, right? And clients are terrible at communicating what they want. So it's better just to show them and see where they react and read their reactions. In the end, this was the event that was built. Let's see if this video plays. Okay, so this was the Dream Gala. So this is a mixture of uh, doing 3D, 
doing Photoshop work. Um, this is my team as, uh, as I was filming them for a bunch of our meetings. There's a lot of projection mapping, and we worked with a lighting company and the event group who actually did all of the floral design. So here you're seeing a seamless drum that we projection mapped with 16 projectors around the outside. It was a black tie event. This was a curved uh, display wall that's built out of display bricks. So when people came up the escalator, that's what they saw. And if you pay attention, you'll notice the colors of the room and the projection on the flowers are shifting in sync with what's on the projection map on the wall. There were sensors built in a surface application that measures specific positions on the wall that tells them what color is on the wall, and that changes the colors of the lights in the room. Everything was in sync. Everything down to that skyline shot right there of the 360 bridge in Austin, Texas, which I shot very late at night from a cliff, um, to the time lapse of those flowers, to right here you see the ink at my photo studio, me dropping ink into a fish tank and then colorizing it in post. That was a huge piece, three months. Thank you. Um, and it was cool to know that they raised enough money for the kids, which is what we cared about the most. So this idea of working with a team, working with the clients, working with vendors like a lighting company, an event design group, we have to have as much collaboration as possible, and we have to be able to work as if you don't matter. right? And that's sort of a weird concept. So this is, this is my production manifesto that I often explain to my team. Work like you won't be here tomorrow. Right? Um, that's not like gothic and morbid. You might get a cold, <laughs> okay? But when, uh, when I first started in the design field, um, my first art director had just transferred in. Uh, he worked at Saatchi and Saatchi, and he said to me, I want you to work for me as if you're gonna get hit by a bus tomorrow. And I was like, that's a bit depressing, <laughs> right? But he says, I need to know where your files are. I need to understand how you built it. I need to know why you built it that way. It needs to be transparent for me, right? So this was that idea of setting others up for success and then you'll succeed yourself. Um, designing with advocacy in mind, right? Trying to set them up as a partner. And if you enable people, maybe they'll do it back for you and they'll become your partners, okay? So that's sort of the idea of today is let's look at some techniques and what's the right way to kind of build some things. So are we good with that so far? Okay, cool. You guys are very, very quiet and very calm. I'm not used to this. <laughs> I'm used to my children in my office running around and screaming behind me. All right. So let's jump over real quick and take a look at a project. So I want to start with something that's a really simple feature inside of Illustrator that when I visit all these shops and I see designers working, I still don't see them actually using these techniques. Okay? So let's start with this idea of some sort of dynamic text. Okay? So we're going to look at something like this. Really basic graphic, really simple. Everybody's built something like this in their lifetime. But trying to understand how to do this through appearance, properties, and values, okay? So let's, uh, let's, let's move this one to one side for a second. Let's get that out of the way. And so uh, the appearance panel, it's not new. Um, but, you know, if, if you've been doing this for a long time, that's usually what I see. I meet designers that have been working for at least six, seven years in their shop. They're very responsible or production artists. They've kind of got set in their ways. They know how they like to build things. Um, if, if it's some of, like some of the production artists I've worked with, they're really surly. They don't want you to question the way they do things. It's like, mine. <sighs> right? So uh, this is one of those techniques that I like to show people and say, hey, you know, maybe you should try this out. So... Let's do, uh, let's do make it, okay? And if you're like me and anybody that's using Illustrator, you are totally sick of Myriad Pro. <laughs> oh, I'm not the only one. Wouldn't it be nice if Adobe would let you set the default font? Yeah, see, Adobe, I know you're in here. <laughs> They're with us, they're listening. I can do those kind of things because I don't actually work for Adobe. All right. So let's take a, a, a quick peek at this, right? So maybe we've got, and eh, that might be too dark for the screen. There we go. So let's say that you've got a font like this, right? Traditionally, if you saw someone doing a text that has a style on it, and what I mean by style is not like, oh, it's bold or it's not bold. Those, those are InDesign styles, right? I'm not talking about character or paragraph styles. I'm talking about graphic appearances, right? You want to put shadows on them, doing that. Um, a lot of time, I see people taking this text, and they'll copy it and they'll paste it, and they'll skew it, right? You everybody with me? 
and they'll make it dark, and they'll do it, and then we've got these two objects that don't live with one another. And if the client comes back in the 11th hour of the 59th minute and says, change it, you've got all these like missing parts, yeah? So the appearance panel allows us to solve some of that problem, okay? If I go in here, the appearance panel is a little weird when you do it with types. Let me show you an object really quickly, just so you can see what's going on. When you look at an object, we'll make it our default, right? White fill, black stroke. Over here in the appearance, it says path, stroke is black, fill is white. We've got our opacity for each of those properties, and then a global opacity property. So it's basically all of the values of the object. But you can stack it. You can do more properties on a single object. So when I have type like this, and I go in here and say, I want to add another fill. There's a button down here at the bottom that allows you to add extra appearance properties. So I'm just going to click on that button. And you see my text term black. Now what's happening is the type is holding the blue property. And I've now added an object property that says add a black fill. Okay. Now if I was to take this, a lot of people don't realize the appearance panel also operates like layers. So if you take this appearance layer, can you, you see when I'm dragging up and down, it's highlighting? Yeah? If I drag that down below characters, my text is blue again because the black fill is now hidden behind the text, okay? But what this means is I can also click directly on that fill. Do you guys see that it's highlighted? Now I could choose other colors and things like that. We're not worried about that right now. Here's the part that people forget. When you use a, a targeted appearance, you can now apply effects to that targeted property, okay? This is a bit like using smart objects inside of Photoshop, but Adobe does all the marketing, and sometimes they don't market certain features, and this is a really good one. So if I go up to effect, and I come down to distort and transform, we've all used this before, right? Yeah, we all play with it? If I go down to where it says free distort, we get like this weird preview from 1999. Be nice if this would get updated, but it is what it is. But when you drag this from its anchor point, right, and we skew it, do something crazy like this, and I hit OK, because I targeted that appearance property, it drops it back there. Now I can also go in and maybe do another effect to it, right? So I'll go in here, uh, what's another good one? Blur. Gaussian blur. Okay, we'll turn on our preview. That's a really obnoxious shadow. There we go. Good. But do you see over in the appearance panel, it now says free distort, Gaussian blur, everything? From an editability standpoint, if I need to change that, I don't have to delete the object and make a new one. I could just go in here and say, I don't like the distortion on it. Click on that little link, it brings it back up, and I can move it again, right? So if my cursor would work, Really? There we go, right? You could distort this again and again and again. Wow, Wacom, what are you doing? There it is, right? So I'll hit OK, ah! right? We can always change it, it reapplies the blur again. I'm gonna put that back for a second. The reason I'm showing you this is, remember that text I showed you where it was like skewed in the sample project for Cisco? Yeah, I need that all to be editable and still have all those appearance properties. So in here, I can take a type tool now and just highlight this and retype, and it's all live. So those shadows live with the type, okay? So when someone comes to me and says, hey, here's my beautiful concept, I'm the art director, now you need to go off and build 50 screens or 150 banners or something crazy like that, I've got my style. <laughs> yeah, and what's really cool is once you have an object like this, right, we're not gonna push it too much further than this, but I have an object like this, you can also go into graphic styles and save it as a style. You can press new, and now that's in there. So anytime someone sends you a piece of type, you can just click on that button, and it's automatically formatted. Okay? Is that helpful? Yeah. Okay, good. All right, so let's keep going. Yeah, so you do have graphic styles uh, also in other applications, but this one, it's, they just don't call it smart objects here, right? All right, so let's close this one out. I want to show you, for those of you that are, that are old school like me, uh, and in the print mindset, I'll show you this one, okay? So paste-ups, we've all learned paste-ups. You've done them when you were in school or, or you know, anywhere else. Um, our business cards are a little bit of a different format in the States, but this is one of those places where I try to tell people, hey, 
you could use it for paste-ups as well as an appearance property. Something really rudimentary, not even graphic as in like a beautiful visualization. So if I grab this business card, for example. Now, hello, guides. Go away. All right, so we'll grab that object, right? Maybe I group it so it's all sort of seen as one object in the appearance panel. Do you guys see it says group? Yeah? If I take this now and I say effect, and we'll go down to distort and transform, and I'll choose transform. Now, I'm going to apologize in advance. I'm going to use inches. I know I'm in Australia. Okay, forgive me. I'm going to set my anchor to the top left corner, okay? And under horizontal, our business card size in the States is 3.5 inches, okay? When I tab off of that and I'm going to turn on my preview, I get a second card. But if I choose copy one, it's going to say, take this object and make one copy three and a half inches away from the original anchor. I press OK. Now I've got two objects, okay? If I grab this object again, and look, if I go to outline view, it doesn't know the other one exists. It's an appearance. So I come back out of it. I'll grab this and say, effect transform again. It's going to give me a little warning. This will apply another instance of this effect to edit the current effect, blah, 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 right? So I'm going to say, yep, go ahead and apply a new effect because I want to do a secondary one. So I apply new effect. Now this time around, I'm going to tell it to go two inches in height. And how many copies do I want? Four, because I want to do a 10 up on a page. I hit preview. There's my paste up, right? Now why does this matter? All right, I've, I've been doing this for a very long time. Um, we used to sort of race each other, like who could do paste-ups faster, and that's what you do when you work at the print house at three in the morning with all the other zombies. So why does this matter, right? Why, why do you care about this? Because when you're doing a paste-up, if you've done this in InDesign in the past, or for the old people here like me, PageMaker, um, or even Quark, <laughs> non-Adobe product, um, if a client comes back and says a change, you want to change a name or whatever, you have to like relink, and there's all this stuff you have to do to make it work, right? Okay, but if I go in here and I just zoom in so you guys can see it a little bit more up close, and let's change my title to Captain Nobody. Did you guys see all of them change? It's live because the appearance property is only reflecting what the original object is. So if you need to change the logo, you need to do anything else, it's like all live updates, right? Now, for those of you that are super technical and you want to get into like mail merging and pulling data in so that it can feed and, and do statistics and things like that, you can do all that as long as you're basing it on that source component as an appearance property. Yeah? Make sense? Okay. I've seen this used in all kinds of ways. I've seen people draw um, an eyeball for, for cartoonists that work at animation houses. And they'll say, yeah, I just want to draw that property, and it's a circle, and I'm going to do a circle smaller as a fill and a smaller one. And now whenever they draw and they click that style, they get eyeballs, right? So they no longer have to draw an eye every single time. So you really want to start getting into this idea of the property. And then also understand that because it's really got links in the appearance panel, all of those properties are still here. I can go back and change them at any time. So if you get a client that says, hey, our business card is going to be an abstract, then put that new measurement in there, and it all becomes dynamic, okay? All right, let's jump away from appearances for a second because uh, I got a lot of stuff to cover for you guys. All right, let's get out of this folder. Here's another one that I don't see people using very often inside of Illustrator, and I'll explain why in a second, okay? I do a lot of work with people that work in 3D, I'm a designer, I don't really know 3D, okay? Um, I understand 3D, I, went, I got my degree in fine art, so I studied perspective, I know how to draw it with a pencil, I know my receding lines and how to calculate the math, and then the moment you put something like C4D or Maya in front of me, I'm like, and I need that young nerd that I can give Mountain Dew and Snickers bars and let him stay up all night and make my 3D models for me, okay? Yes, you can play Halo, just to finish my model, okay. Um, this is getting better with, with some of the Adobe tools. Um, Jesus Ramirez was showing some of the 3D tools uh, with Photoshop earlier and Felix and Fuse. Zorana Gee is going to be here tomorrow showing some of that. Um, but a lot of time, I just need to be able to get like a concept across, right? And if I'm explaining it to my motion graphics artist or my 3D person, I'm like, no, just a, just a hair more, the thing, the dimension thing, thingamabobber, right? And they're like, oh, that's clear direction, thanks. Um, 
Here's how I do it. I do it in Illustrator, okay? So here's a graphic of my old phone, right? This is an old illustration of an HTC phone. Um, you'll notice I have the front and I have the back, and the back is backwards for a very specific reason. But I'm just going to grab each of these, and you'll also notice I have a silhouette over here of the phone. Okay, I'm going to do a very important first step. You can't do this without this step. Um, if you're not playing with symbols inside of Illustrator, and you haven't gone back and looked at how uh, symbols can support you, it is an extremely powerful feature, and I would say 95% of designers I work with never use them and don't understand what they do. Okay, it's, it's basically embedding a library link object, right, within itself. So if I go into symbols, and I've selected my front of my phone, I'm going to hit new symbol, and we'll just call this front, and I'm going to grab the back one, I'm going to click the new button, and I'm going to call this back, and then terrifyingly, I'm going to throw these away. But they're in my symbols, right? They're here over here in the panel. I can drag them out if I need them. That's fine. Here's what we're going to do if we've got to work with uh, somebody that's doing 3D. And I'm just having one of those moments. Do you guys ever realize you have a smudge on your screen and you keep thinking it's an object you're trying to select? Yeah, right? Okay, so here's my object. And I'm going to go to Effect, and I'm going to go to 3D, Extrude and Bevel. Now, terrifying filter. I can feel designers in the room right now going, are you making word art? What are you doing? <laughs> like, is this for your high school flyer? I don't understand, right? Because that's what it was used for. They released this thing in a really early iteration of Illustrator, and all people did was text, extrude, and it was, you know, just like, oh, yeah, crazy big text. It was <laughs> terrifying, right? So that's not what we're going to do, but let's take a look at the other features that no one ever clicks into, right? So if you're lonely and you, you drink on a Friday night like me, you're clicking the buttons you've never played with. And here's where they are. Down here at the bottom, there's a button that says Map Art. You guys see that? It brings up this dialog box, and a few of you have clicked on it and said, nope, don't know what that is, I'm out of here. Okay? <laughs> cancel, cancel, cancel. It's got words like geometry. Ah, I didn't, I didn't go to art school to know math. Okay. So in here, it lets you know how many faces exist when this object is turned into 3D. Do you guys see that little red outline right there? Let me see if I can zoom in. Eh. Do you guys see that red? That lets me know which face I'm on right now. So if I went to face two, the red line would move. It jumps to the back. This is how you know which surface it's referencing. So when I'm on the front surface, if I go in here and say symbol, there's the one that I added earlier. There's front of the phone. If I go to my next surface, which is the back, and I choose back, and I hit preview, my phone is now modeled in 3D inside of the original vector silhouette. Okay? So it's not like a very complicated 3D process, but what's cool about this, now, traditionally, if, I'm, if I would do work, I'm not going to do it in front of a whole bunch of people, but normally I would hit shade artwork. Do you see the brackets, though? It says slower. We're not doing that now, okay? Just out of safety. But know that it's there, and you can actually map much better render effects with that vector, okay? So I'm just going to hit OK for a second. Now, in here, I can now pick what do I want my depth to be. That's like a 2003 phone. It's a little thick and chunky, right? It's like iPhone 2. Um, so let's bring this down to maybe 15, okay? Now it's a nice thin phone, okay? And if I want to, I can move it around in a 3D space, okay? So my phone turns, I can tilt it, anything that I want. And this is an appearance property. Now you can also get into, ah, screw it, let's do the shading. Let's see if we can break it. Because now there's another button that says more options, which means now I can go in here and there's a light sphere. I can move lighting around. Do you see the phone change? This is all vector. This has been around for a really, really long time. And nobody pushed the buttons because you're scared. <laughs> right? You can even preserve spot colors if you have to work with Pantones. I don't know why you'd do that, but hey, maybe you need to. Okay, now here's the important part though. So I do this and I go, okay. And I'm thinking as a production advocate in mind and my client calls me and says, yeah, we're doing that banner. We wanna do that Apple thing where the iPhone looks like it's dancing across the screen because you know, it's Fantasia and phones do that. So grab this phone 
and drag a copy of it. There it is, right? And again, if you look at the outline view, that's all Illustrator sees. The rest is math. But if I go into that appearance panel, there's my 3D extrude and bevel. I click on that little link, and there's all my properties. So I can start moving it. I can start making my phone dance the other way, hit preview again. There's my phone the other way. Sorry? Can it take it out of isometric? Into just not having like the 3D space? Oh, yeah, yeah, you can. So it's, it's not very good at doing a true. So the question was, can you make it so that it actually does some perspective to it? You've got this very rudimentary perspective slider, which really should just be called lens distortion, right? It just kind of, Bleh. So depending on how hard you push it is how much it's going to skew, okay? But, yeah, you can make it have a little bit of that lens perspective. See the front end's getting bigger on you? But that's about as close as you can do with those kind of perspectives. Yeah, now, if you want to get into doing vanishing points and some crazy stuff like that, then you need to start looking at the actual 3D view grid. Um, and I have a couple videos online of how to use that. There's some real neat tricks that Adobe didn't really talk about in the help guides. Um, but that's another way that you can actually get to where you control the perspective planes. And I will say, for those of you that have played with that, one of the frustrations in the past was you couldn't have linked symbols in the 3D perspective grid. You now can. So you can update symbols in 3D view. So this gives you guys a little bit of an update just on this idea of a really old tool that allows us some powerful production advocacy, right? Because when I need to produce a concept to show a client quickly, I didn't have to really render that, right? Um, I didn't have to do anything that involved a very advanced 3D engine, but I can quickly portray my concept to my client, and I can also portray it to the person that might be doing a high-res 3D render. Now, I'll be honest, I've finished out projects where I've just used this technique. Um, if you're someone that has to do a lot of icons in 3D, right? maybe you're building textures and you've got just boxes and you want 3D boxes, a wood box, a metal box, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Once I've built a symbol of that texture, I can just map it to all of the surfaces and just apply that appearance style every time. right? So even if I saved this as a graphic style, okay, there it is. If I was to not use a phone, Right? If I was just to draw an object, superstar, okay, when I click on that, there it goes. It just maps for whatever the last one was, right? This is the one I based the style on. So it's got that same depth to it, which is very thin, and it's got that same perspective, okay? This kind of thing saves you a lot of time, but I still see when I go to agencies or internal creative groups, Someone changing their mind, like, oh, we don't want the phone to face away from the text. We want it to face uh, toward the text. And I'll see a designer go, all right, I'll see you after lunch. And then they, like, go in and they grab the original straight form and then they skew it and distort it. And then they're, like, trying to draw a duplicate in the background and they're trying to fill in the gaps to make it look 3D. And I'm sitting there just like, why? What are you doing? Right? This is much faster, much easier. Okay. Are we good there? Yeah? Okay, cool. Sounds like people are learning some things. I like that. That's why I'm here. I watched four really bad movies on a plane just so I could be here. <laughs> I will say, though, Australian sci-fi, y'all are weird. <laughs> I watched a movie, and I don't know what it was, Osiris or something like that, someone in a desert and a kid with a monster, and it was, I was like, I'm not going to sleep now. <laughs> Bring more of the Jack Daniels. All right, so here's another technique uh, I want to talk about, okay? Let's look at a photo. Photo editing, we all do that, yeah? Right, we gotta do that for our clients? Okay, here's a technique I wrote about um, in Scott Valentine's book, The Hidden Power of Adjustment Layers. And this is a technique I've been using for a really, really long time. Um, and here's why I created this technique. I hate making selections. I hate marching ants and I hate magic wands. Because they're not magical, they should be called the frustration wand, okay? <laughs> I don't know who was playing Dungeons and Dragons, but it's not magical, okay? That's not true, it does some cool stuff. But you don't need to use it as often as I see designers using it. So here's a good example, right? Imagine if you were the designer, I'm just gonna stretch for a second, if you were the designer and this was the stock image that was given to you, okay? Uh, I shot this in Gonzales, Texas, it was an abandoned theater. 
But if you were given something like this, it was already rasterized out, you don't have the raw file, you're just given a stock JPEG, okay? There are many times you get a photo and you're like, man, if the exposure, if the photographer had just done this, right? Like, this building is in the shadow. I'd really like that building to not feel like it is in the shadow. Or, man, if they just timed it a little bit later in the day, the sky would have more blue, etc. cetera. So let's, let's imagine that for a second. If you had a uh, creative director who says, yeah, I love it, it's going to go in your layout, it's awesome, just need you to fix a few things. And they want you to turn up all the red in the sign, bring out the yellow in the building. And by the way, could you just make a perfect selection around those clouds so that you can darken the sky a bit, right? So here's how I usually see people do it. Agree uh, if you do it or not. I see people immediately go in here with a magic wand, right? And they're like, I'm going to click a sky. Oh, I missed a bit, right? Shift, click the sky. But they've got some edges in here. Right? You don't have feathering or the understanding of alpha when you use the magic wand. It tries to make an edge. You could feather it, but then you're going to end up with the same amount of softness around every cloud. Are we all in agreement? Yeah? It's frustrating. So I'm going to say something now that hurts. Okay? Um, <laughs> this is how I had to write in the book. You're going to use black and white to control color. I know. Ow. Okay, But most of the time, if someone says, I want a darker sky, or I want brighter red letters, I immediately some, see someone make a selection, and then they jump into levels or curves. Yeah? Okay, here's how I do this. I go to my adjustment layer, right, which is the half-dipped cookie down here at the bottom. For those of you that don't know the technical term, that's a half-dipped cookie. Because <laughs> we're hungry. All right, so I'm going to click in here, and I'm going to choose black and white. Has everyone used this before? Yeah, it was great, right? Back in the old days, we just desaturated or made something grayscale. We pushed it with contrast. Yay! They made this a little bit better because it can isolate particular frequencies. But there was a point when I was playing with this one night. It was probably that Friday night I was clicking buttons. And I said to myself, it has every color frequency right here. This is kind of like hue and saturation, but much more specific. What if when I choose black and white, I change the blend mode from normal. Now, here's why I'm bringing this up, because most people that play with blend modes, I understand they're scary things, they're called algorithms and formulas, and immediately it's math and designers run away. But we normally learn things like multiply, screen, and overlay. And then occasionally we'll, we'll play with its weird neighbor just to see what other effects we get, okay? <laughs> I was really a jerk in Scott's book, and I know this is going on camera, but whatever. Uh, when he told me Matt Kloskowski was also writing for the book, Matt opened his segment by saying, you really only need to know four or five blend modes. Multiply, screen, overlay. These are the ones designers use, right? So I opened my segment with, you'll probably have people tell you you only need to know five blend modes. <laughs> so I'm going to use the one way down at the bottom that no one ever ventures to, right? It's way down under. Hey, luminosity. What is luminosity? It's another word for light. And what is light? It's exposure, okay? So instead of me making a selection to control any frequency in this photograph, let me zoom this in here. Now, because this black and white adjustment is looking at the photograph as if it is representing light, luminosity, when I grab a particular color frequency, it allows me to change the light exposure of that particular thing. So I can go into red and say, nope, shouldn't have been in the shadow. Brighten that up, right? If I want to play with the yellows of the wall and get more texture or less, okay, I can recover it. There's a little button in here. Nobody ever sees it. Let me zoom in. See that little guy? It's like your guilty grandmother going, no, no, no. <laughs> okay? If you look at that, it, it's, it's a sampler tool. Now, this is really important. Uh, this photograph doesn't show it quite as well. But if you picked on a particular sample and that color value was a mix of two particular sliders, when you use this to sample, right, I'll just do the red, and it's going to move the red slider. But as you move this, it moves the red slider, okay? If that particular color you sampled on was like so 50-50 it couldn't decide, it would move them both in relative ratio, okay? I use this all the time as a technique because I, owning a photo studio, I have to do headshots and portraits and, and um, commercial work for people. And I'm like, oh, i got to underexpose it because I don't want to lose the background. But then I just go in and sample their skin with this technique, and I just drag it up. 
and skin tones, regardless of where you are from on the world, we're all some shade of burnt sienna. Okay? We're not orange like our president, just burnt sienna. Okay? <laughs> so, one dig. One. I get one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Our, my president. Yeah. So, now, if, uh, if I was to turn that red up, right, I get that brighter exposure. Now, I might be losing some of the saturation. That's okay, too. I could just go into hue and saturation now, target that same value, reds. There's a little bracket in here that lets me know exactly what frequency it's going into. I'm just going to use the eyedropper to sample it, right? Let's grab this red. So, it just, it moved a little bit, okay? But now I can saturate that and bring that color back, Okay? So now I've got a photograph that's got some better exposure. I've got unique color control. I can identify particular components. Now, if there was like a red sign over here, I didn't want it, fine. Just big old black mask right across that. Yeah. Yeah, there's a lot of this online. And then um, uh, Jesus isn't here right now, but he's going to bug me if I don't do this. I just created a Facebook page for Life by Pixels, which is what I go by. And I'm going to post these tutorials as a downloadable PDF after this, Okay. <laughs> Wow, that's easy, guys, easy. A lot of energy there. Oof. <laughs> Everyone just like took a big deep breath. Oh, thank God. <laughs> Ow, end of day, guy. No beer. Okay. But do you guys see the value of this? And what haven't I done yet? I haven't made a selection. I haven't made one, okay? Now, it works the same way. Just let me show you one other example of it. Let's go back to bridge. So, like, here's a picture of uh, my friend Ashley. We found this cool door in Smithville, Texas, and I was like, oh, my God, you have red hair, a blue dress, and green. You're RGB. Okay. Because I'm that kind of nerd. Okay. But same thing. You're using black and white to control color. Okay. So, with that in mind, I could change the exposure on her dress. Right? I could, let's see if that sampler works. Let's grab her skin. Uh, it's still seeing her as red, right? Now, in that same window, I can make multiple versions of that black and white adjustment layer, or I can just target multiple things at a time and control them separately. But what you haven't seen me do yet is make a freaking selection. And I see it all the time. I walk into agencies, and I'm like, what are you doing? Oh, I've got to change your dress. And they're clicking with the pen tool. And I was like... 102, 103, and they're just click, 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 click. It's like the crocodile in Peter Pan. So you don't have to, right? You can just use exposure as a concept. Those formulas are there for a reason. Now, I'm not going to deep dive too much into it right now, but I will say this. If you're using levels, everybody use levels? Yeah, we've done that, right? And you're exposing like some sort of tonal contrast, it blows my mind. I see people using levels to adjust something. And then I say, why are you doing it? They're like, well, I want to brighten the picture. But the colors change because they leave it on normal. Change it to luminosity because now you're not increasing the saturation as you're increasing contrast, right? The blend modes are really powerful for that. If you're using hue and saturation to change a color, you're also changing lighting. Change it to the color blend mode. It will only change the color, not the exposure. Crazy. But, you know, it's a lot of time. Uh, I, I did a big project last year retouching for a book for National Geographic, right? So I had all these wildlife photographs I had to edit for them. And the original files that came from the first retoucher, when they did the test print, they were like, yeah, colors look burned. There's all kinds of stuff going on. And it was really as simple as that. He just was using the blend modes wrong, right? Just think about how that would apply with the edit, okay? All right, is this making sense? Useful? Excellent. I like being useful. I'm useless at home. Okay. All right. Here's another one. Very, very useful one. Okay. I only saw a few people raise their hands in the room when I asked who is a photographer. So I, I want to I wanna cover this one. Okay. This is a photo that a friend of mine took for a shoot. I don't know what was going on. I think he was tired. But he nuked this photo. Right? No problem with her pose, no problem with, she's like this Penelope Cruz look-alike thing. Right? But he blew out the dress, and it was a shoot for the dress manufacturer. It was a fashion company. And I'm like, uh, dude, there's all kinds of lace and nice little details in there, and we have lost a lot of it. Okay. Have you guys run into this? 
headshots of executives, you got to fix the white shirt that's blown out and other things like that. Anybody that's worked on wedding photography, you know, they shoot with the flash and there goes her really expensive dress with no details anymore, okay? How do we fix it, okay? And designers, because we've been taught these very traditional approaches in Photoshop, what I see is they make some crazy selection in here, so they'll go in and try that quick selection tool and be like, me, 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 right? And they'll do levels and curves and like try to pull it as far down as possible. Oh, it's still thinking, that's good. Right? I don't do that. I use a photography engine that's built into Photoshop. So first, production advocacy in mind, I'm gonna make this a smart object. If you've drank as much Adobe Kool-Aid as I have, you already know what smart objects are. But if you don't, it's a container that wraps around that particular graphic asset that allows you to apply adjustments to it that aren't permanent. They're not like raster rendered into that particular graphic, okay? We all agree on that? Yeah, good, I see heads nodding. That means you're awake. So, I'm gonna go up to where it says filter. Filter, those are for bad special defects. No, go to camera raw filter. And people think that this is only for raw. You can open flat JPEGs, TIFFs, you can open all kinds of stuff inside of raw, right? Here's, people open this up and they're like, I don't know what's happening, my histogram has colors, ah, right? They freak out. But there's a brush up here at the top called the adjustment brush, right? I'm just gonna show you guys this today. This is the part we're gonna focus on. Well, hang on, let's fix her white balance real quick, because she's green. So let's go auto, it's a little colder, right? But if I went in here and tried to rescue her dress with like highlights, that doesn't get me much. If I bring whites down, now I've got this weird flat gray dress thing, right? It's not very helpful. So let's put those back. The adjustment brush, the moment you click on it, this panel on the right is gonna change. You guys see that? It changes. It puts you into an editor control panel that is relative to only the areas you paint with that brush, okay? It's kind of like a quick, a bit like a quick mask or a rubolith. So, in here, I'm gonna reset this for a second because I was playing with it earlier, okay? And if I go down here where it says mask and auto mask, I'm just gonna turn these on. I normally don't, but I'm gonna turn these on so that I can uh, let you guys see where it is that I'm masking. Okay, so as I paint, do you guys see it like does edge detection there? All right, it's nice and sharp, okay? But what I'm really concerned with is that back part of the dress, okay? Now if I hold option, it turns into an eraser and I can turn off auto mask so that it's a little bit more free. Just knock those parts out, okay, cool. Now, let's turn off the mask visibility so we know I've got a selection there. You see the little pin? That means that's where I started my painting. I now have like a selected area relative to that. Okay, they added this feature. Um, we saw it at Adobe Max Sneaks a couple years ago and they called it dehaze. And everybody was like, whoa. And the idea was they showed a big picture of this forest in China that was very foggy and they slid dehaze and all the fog went away. And we were like, awesome. I never work on foggy pictures. <laughs> Why would I do that, right? If I shot fog, I wanted the fog. <laughs> Weird, okay? Now, I mean, I get it. If you're shooting LA or Beijing, there's smog, you wanna remove that, sure. But again, always think about where else could I use this thing, right? So dehaze turns out that it's really good at grabbing median tones and recovering detail from very, very small amounts of data, okay? This, is, this area of her dress, it's like a small spike in the histogram. But if you slide up dehaze, it starts pulling back all that dress data. Now, I'm not saying it's perfect. There's artifacts in there, right? It's got weird color tints. It's got other problems. We can add clarity for some more detail, right? We can, that's, when I did the highlights and whites earlier, it didn't, that didn't come back, right? Totally different level of recovery that exists here, okay? Now, I'm gonna pull that back a little bit because we don't, we don't save it that much. Okay, but I like some of that detail of the dress. But because I've already built my mask, I've already selected it, all these weird little color artifacts, I'm just gonna go into saturation and completely desaturate that. Now I kind of get a gray white dress again, okay? And then up at the top for the area that I painted, I've got some white balance temperatures. I'll just slide this towards yellow so it matches the woods that she's, she's actually in, right? So I can get a little bit of a tint going on in here, slide that across. Maybe bring a little bit of that color back in, okay? If I want, I can pull that back to lighten it just a little bit. Go in there. 
But if I put that side by side, that's what we started with. Look at how much data that recovered. You can't do that with levels and curves. I've tried lots. Yeah, question? Uh, the one that I got from him, he sent me um, high-res JPEGs. So this one, I just force-opened the JPEG into camera raw. So if you were working in raw, you could do the same technique. But the thing that, that we're talking about today is really um, how do designers get to work with this production mindset. And I regularly see designers that have to work with stock photographs and then think that they can't work like the photographer would. The tools still work for you guys too, right? We just don't tend to think that way, right? We go back to our, our default uh, mode of operation. So after that, if I press OK, that filter is applied because I made the layer, I converted it into a smart object, right? Now at this point, I've got a lot of other controls because this is a smart object. Like if we did a test print and just said, hey, way too strong, right? I can double click on camera raw filter right down here in the layer and it goes right back and all of my settings are still here. The trick is I gotta click on the adjustment brush to bring that little badge back, click on it, and then I get all those settings back, okay? They're all in here. If I wanted to blend it, there's this teeny weeny little hidden icon in the layer right there. Do you guys see that, little sliders? That allows me to double click, I'll zoom out, and it brings up a blending option for that filter. So if I just wanted to do our usual trick of, hey, turn down the opacity, I could blend it that way without going back into the filter. So you have an unbelievable amount of control, but if I did get hit by that bus, the next day the next designer or production person who picks up this file, they're gonna see that smart filter See it right here and go, oh, I know what he did. Double click that, make the adjustment, save it out. Boom, they're done. But if I only left them with a converted baked version of the dress rescued and they said, oh, it's too punchy, two things happen. They go back to the source. I see this hundreds of times. They go back to the source and try to do it again themselves. It's a waste of time. Or they edit on top of the original edits, which means now they're damaging the quality of the blending in the image file. Right? Editing on an edit on an edit on an edit is a bad process. So we want to be as close to the source as we can be when we're allowed to be. All right, is this making sense? Yeah? Okay, cool. All right, let's get a little bit more into some production versus stuff like this. All right. Dune save. Oh, I was going to show one other one for that. Let me, let me do that one too. This is a, another one. I, I actually got asked to do this one the other day, so I just wanted to show it. Um, because it was another one of those examples of, hey, what would you do in this case, right? And we got the call. So let me, let me walk you guys through this real quick. The, the request was, this was being used on a report, and this was the original photo, right? And uh, it's a smart object right now just to kind of protect it. But the request from the art director was, can you make the cloud more detailed? So think about that phrase for a second. Can you make the cloud more detailed? <laughs> yes, I'll use my godlike powers, <laughs> right? Um, also known as Photoshop. So, you know, this is a really complex form because it's a cloud, right? It's not a very creative cloud. Um, but how would I select it? So there's a feature in channels that, and, and you can do it lots of ways, right? You, you could try using a magic wand, but you guys know as well as I do, if I use the magic wand in here, it's gonna like select inside of squares, if I turn off contiguous and I click in there, gazoon tape, it's gonna like jump all over here. But again, it's not gonna get fringing on the edges. It's a problem. So the way that I did this, ooh, my sign just fell down. That's a bad omen. It means, uh, you can just throw it away. It's fine, I don't care. Cool, thank you, sir. Um, you have a luminosity mask that is hidden inside of Photoshop. If you don't know what that is, um, some of you may know the technique where you can command click on an object and it makes a selection of whatever's visible on that layer. But very often people don't go to the RGB channel and command click on it. See that little box I'm getting? This loads a luminosity channel. Been around forever. But if you click on this, it will select anything from 50% gray to the brightest value in your image. Okay, from middle to highlight. Now, I'll throw away my other alpha channel here because that's one I made earlier. And I'm not, gonna, I'm not gonna do that to you guys. So, 
if I go in here now with maybe a lasso tool, all right, let's go lasso. I'm gonna hold option to subtract, and I'm just gonna very rudimentarily kind of go in and remove this other stuff. Okay, we'll go around the building. Okay, so now I've got a selection of the cloud, but what kind of selection is it really? So let's, let's double check it in the alpha channel. If I go to create a new channel, just click on the new button, and I fill that with white, okay, I've got a good amount of what that luminosity channel was detecting, okay? From here, I have the ability, I'll just deselect, to modify this. I'll modify it with levels to go in here and basically start crunching out some of that background. So now I have the clouds. I just slid in my low key to remove the low end of the gray. And now, because I have a channel, if you've been using Photoshop a while, you know that you can either go to select, load selection, and choose that channel. There's alpha one. And when I press OK, there's the marching ants of that, which means that if I create from this a copy, I'll just hit Command-J, now I've got the cloud as the only part on that, uh, uh, from the image. So when the art director says to me, can you make that more detailed, now I'm telling myself, aha, I can make this a smart object, and now I can go up to filter and do camera raw filter, and now maybe I, now you can't see it because it's a white cloud on a checkered background. You guys are all getting like a migraine now, right? But under effects, I have that dehaze feature, okay? So I can start going in here and playing with all of these controllers, adding some clarity, maybe doing some sharpening to hope that it brings out some detail, right? And when I press okay, I've got more detail in a cloud, okay? So it's places like that where um, I'm doing very sort of abstract approaches to how I make selections and how I make those edits. But again, if I wanted to change my mind, that raw filter's right there. Okay, I wouldn't have to throw away this layer and figure out how to go back and make that selection again because you have a jerk co-designer that didn't save the alpha channel. All right, and you shake your fist at them. All right, cool. Okay, here's another one I wanted to show. How many of you guys are still using Bridge? All right, a couple of people. Shame on the rest of you, okay? Bridge is awesome. <laughs> shame, shame. Yeah, you gotta love Bridge, man. Um, it's a really, really helpful utility for managing your assets, but more importantly, it's, uh, it's got like special Bermuda Triangle-like portals to get you into features that most people don't play with. So, let's paint the story for a second. Okay, you're a designer. You've been asked to work on some campaign or a report or a website or whatever that has a lot of photographs on it. Yeah, have we all been there? And you come up with some style for those photographs. So you then take that style and go, how do I apply this to like 50 or 75 photographs? Yeah, we all there? How would we do that in the past? Actions? Is that how you guys would do it? Yeah, I see people going, yeah, 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 right? Yeah, actions. That's how we would normally do it. And I used to make a lot of money just making actions for people. They call me up, we're doing this thing all year, we need a process, I need a droplet. And I'm like, okay, I'll write you an action. And that progressed in, um, you know, out there in design land where people started writing scripts and that started getting into intelligence levels that I don't have. So I was like, man, that's, I, I can't automate that way. But then I realized there's this raw engine, right? We just looked at it a second ago. When you have a bunch of photos, these are a series of lifestyle photos that were given to me by a client, right? This is from their, their asset library. I can select all of these inside of Bridge. Now this is important because you can't open all these in Photoshop and then say, I would like them all to be in RAW, right? Because RAW is a filter in Photoshop for non-RAW images, just like we just did. So then you work on one at a time and you go back and forth. But if you're in Bridge and you select them all, you can either push this little button up here that says to open in camera raw, or you can simply right click on it and say open in camera raw, okay? Now when I choose that, they all come in to ACR. All of these files are here, which means if you're doing that really popular style that's been trending for a while of, hey, you know what I wanna do? I wanna go in here and maybe desaturate this a little bit. 
I want to push some vibrance in here. Let's pull that down. I really want to get gritty, so I want to bring in my clarity. I'm going to reduce my contrast, right? We're just stylizing for the sake of stylizing right now. Um, you know what? And I want to do a split tone kind of cinematic thing. So let's make all of my shadows or my highlights warm. Okay? Let's make all of my shadows cold. Okay? So you guys have seen this effect before, right? It's kind of that desat blue thing. I can decide if I want more or less somewhere. Okay. So here's the thing. I, this is really just about what I see designers doing. I go to their offices. I watch them work. They've got this style. They do one of two things. They write an action, or they copy the adjustment layers in Photoshop they've used, and they'll drag those from document to document to document. Does that sound about right? Yeah? But here, I've done my stylizing. So I can go over to the film strip where all the photos exist. I can right-click on it and say Select All, and then go Sync. And it's going to ask me, what do I want to synchronize? And I've got all these controllers. Now, if you have to add, let's, let's show one further before I do that sync, okay? Let's go back here. Uh, if you've ever had to do like a little bumper graphic at the bottom for text, you need the bottom part of the photo to be dark, right? We've all had that before. I can use that adjustment control, right? Here's the brush. There's another one that's called a graduated filter. If I drag this up from the bottom, doo -doo 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 -doo, I need darker bottoms on all my photographs, okay? So now, let's turn off my settings from earlier. I'm just going to turn down exposure and make the bottom part of the photos dark. Now, does that look good as a photograph? No. But no one's going to be concerned with that when I put the titles of, like maybe we're using these photos as chapter dividers in the financial report, right? Segway slides. If I like that, awesome. Now, if I do select all and sync settings, it'll ask me down at the bottom, do I also want to include localized adjustments, which is what that graduated filter is. So I turn that on, Gazunte. I press OK, watch the film strip on the left. Do you guys see them all update? Yeah? So now I can click through these. I see they've all got that tone and everything applied to them. They all look like they're out of The Walking Dead. <laughs> see, judgy designers are in this room. They're like, that's not a healthy look. I don't know why you're doing that. I wouldn't put that in my report. No one asked you. <laughs> okay. But... You do have the option now to select all these and choose save images, but the other thing that I can do is I can just hit done. Right? I'm just going to press done. And now those all updated inside uh, of that directory because there's metadata telling it what the appearance should be. So I've done all that editing one time. Now, if I was to go to tools, Photoshop, image processor, right? most people don't play with this one either. This is a, a script inside of Photoshop, but here, I just load it as a tool. All right, I'll leave that up for a second. People can see it. Okay, click on it, and it's going to ask me, what would you like to do with all those images? I can choose where I want to save them or just save them in the same location. So I've got them going to a processed folder. Do you want to make a JPEG, a PSD, or a TIFF? Uh, I believe Russell Brown has an adaptation of this image processor on his website. It will also do PNGs. Okay. If you wanted to run an action on top of this image processor, if you said, yeah, I want you to make all these uh, smaller JPEGs for this website, but I also want you to add a frame or crop or whatever your action would be, you could choose it from down here, right? I've got one called Old Film Restore. I'm going to turn that back off, though. And maybe I want to resize them all. Hey, these are all going on a web page, and I need them to be whatever, if it's height or width, doesn't matter. I want them all to fit 800 pixels as the longest edge. So I put those in. So now we're going to hit run. And it just goes through those really quickly. It does the resizing and processing and the file save as, and it's done. OK? I go back to bridge. Here's my processed folder. There's the JPEG folder. There's all my little JPEGs from there. If I open it back up, let's check the image size. It's 800 pixels. OK? That saves me a lot of time. And what I see people doing is, They'll go in and like make their edits, and then they try to make an action, and then they can't figure out why the action doesn't work beyond a certain point, so they only run the action up to here. Then they go back and open every one and go, change the size, file save as, and they're doing this thing, right? But this allowed us to make a tonal edit all the way across a library, and then very, very quickly export it out, and never actually damage the original files, because it's metadata. So 
if I went back to bridge, these original JPEGs that my client gave me, it looks like I've permanently changed them, right? But you guys saw me hit done. Nobody ever saw me hit save. They're not saved. They're just appearance properties. So if I right-click on them, and I go to develop settings, and I say clear settings. Oh, am I in the wrong folder? Oh, thank you. Save me from looking like an idiot. Yeah. Develop settings, clear settings. They all go back to normal. So nothing was permanent. It's just an appearance property, right? So when people say, wow, you're really expensive per hour. I don't think we can afford you. And I go, I can do that in 20 minutes. And they go, no, you can't. Yeah, I can't. Right? Because it's little tricks like that that'll help save you some time. Oh, no, I would never tell them that. I would tell my co-designer that. I'd say, what if I can do it in 20 minutes? You owe me lunch. Right? All right. Let's get into some more uh, cross-the-spectrum type stuff before we run out of time. Okay? So I want to look a little bit at working with CC libraries. I know that's kind of a new thing. Kari talked a lot about that earlier. She's probably telling Teresa about it now. It's very exciting. Um, but if you're, if you're working with CC libraries, there are parts of CC libraries that haven't really become clear to users yet. And there's, it's still new, okay? So we're, we're still kind of figuring out how to work with it. But let's look at a few parts, okay? So for example, if I want to put... Um, a design on this box. Let me go close this one back out. Right, we've got our box here, and I've got my graphic that I want to put on there. Okay, so if you've been reading the marketing and you've been seeing all the stuff, you know that you can put an asset inside of a library. Yeah, and then you know that that like is a pipe and it's a portal and it speaks to all the programs and it's very magical. Okay. Um, but what doesn't happen all the time is, how do I set myself up for production success when I want to change my mind, right? I'm always worried that my clients are going to change their mind. Or if I have to work on a team and collaborate with people, how can I set up the file in a way that they can keep working and I don't have to do replicate work later? Because sometimes we get out of sync with each other, right? So let's talk about that for a second. Um, I do already have one Sugar Skulls in my library, but I'm going to make a new one, and here's why. What happens when you want to add a graphic like this inside of your library is you might go in here and select that one skull, and down here, way in the bottom, there's a little plus symbol, right? It says add content. If you click on that, it'll ask you if you want to add a graphic or whatever the property is. In this case, I only have a fill color. I'm just going to choose graphic. Now, the problem with that, if I choose add right now, I'm going to get that skull off of that layer. But I've been working on lots of sugar skulls. They're all slightly different. Okay? I like the one with the mustache. I'm not sure which one the client's going to want. And I don't want to have to replace every single one of these, nor do I want all of them in my CC library. So what I do is I turn all of these on, and it looks like garbage. That's okay. We're going to live with that for a second. I'm going to select all of them. You guys see all the layers are lit up? And then I'm going to choose to add that graphic. I'm not going to add the fill color. We'll press add. Okay? And it's called artwork one. Okay? So we'll, we'll rename this skull live. Okay? Because we're doing this live. Now, at this point, my skulls are gray for a reason. I'm going to take advantage of something else. But let's close this one out. Okay? Don't save. If I go over to Photoshop now and I've got my, my product shot in here, it means I can grab my skull, skull live, and just drag it in. Okay, here's my skull. Let's make it bigger. Okay, and if I hold the command key, all right, or control if you're on Windows, I can now grab an anchor point and distort this. Okay, so I can grab these handlebars and pull it down. I can try to match my perspective, right? just for some sort of proof of concept. Press return. Now, there's my very, very busy, all these sugar skulls stacked. But now if I go back to the skull live, because you selected all of them, it made it into one file. Now if I double click on this, and it brings it back up in Illustrator, 
I can go through those layers and turn the ones off that I don't want, hit save, and when I go back into Photoshop, there it is updated. So when my clients say, hey, we want to see multiple versions of this. Now, this is supposed to look kind of like a print on the box. I'm going to change this to color burn. I'm going to reduce the opacity a little bit so it looks like it's actually on the box. This allows the lighting from the shot to blend through. If I have to composite anything like textures or uh, surface forms, it's almost always going to be 50% gray. I almost always do that because then it'll adopt the lighting more believably. Okay? But now if the client changes their mind, I've got a little tiny cloud icon in here, which will link to that particular CC library asset, or I can double click on here again. It takes me back over there, say, nope, we want to see a different skull. Let's go to the one, I call this one Jesus. Okay, I hit save. He's not here, so I can pick on him. All right, go back. There's Jesus. Yeah? And just like normal smart objects, if you were in some way working with this where, hey, I want to be able to do like a wraparound graphic, that's fine too, right? So if I take this and I make it like really big and you're doing something, I'm just going to rough this in because we're running out of time, right? But I do this. And then maybe I make a duplicate of that layer. We go back in and start playing with other perspective forms, right? Something a bit more like that. And I'm trying to figure out where that's going to line in so it wraps around. You guys get kind of the idea here. Right? If I was to mask between those two, and th this is why I, I, I try to remind everybody, like, please, please, please use libraries and use smart objects. Because if you take the time to set this up right, okay, so we'll take this one and mask it. Okay, so that's only showing the bottom. I'm going to drag this mask. I'm going to hold Option and drag this mask to the other layer. And I'm going to invert it so it only shows the top. So Command-Shift-I or Command-I, uh, Command-I, sorry, if you want to invert that mask. Okay, so there's the top. peek -boo. Okay, here it is at the bottom. Right Now, we want to do some cleanup try to you know, fix some of the misalignments and things that are in here. Okay, I don't want to waste too much time on this, but my OCD is kicking in. <laughs> you guys live it too, don't hate. All right, but the important part being, they're all linked to that same asset in the library. So if I, as the art director, tell my designer, hey, uh, you know what, I want to show them some more options this afternoon. Uh, the file's in the library, go add a few more skulls. They've got this as a file that they can edit. So they can go in and draw more. They can maybe do merges, whatever they want to do. But if I update that, and I hit save, and I go back, both of those get updated. So the dimensional form and everything is kept. I'm not replicating production work. And I see this all the time with junior designers that work for us. I say, hey, I want you to add some more things. And they immediately go in and go, oh, I'm going to have to do this. And they delete all the work that I did. And they start retransforming. I'm like, what are you, all right, it's that time. Let's sit down. All right, and then we start walking through this. So this is really just using libraries in a way that, that buys you that time and so you don't have to do replicate production. Is that making sense? I know this isn't as sexy as the earlier stuff, but it's really important um, for understanding this workflow. Let's go a little bit further, okay? Now, this one we're gonna pray to the internet gods that this works okay. <laughs> Let's see if this opens. Okay, it did. Nice. So here's a menu concept, right? And as I'm working this concept, let's, let's again, let's paint the scenario that's pretty common. In the old days, we would download comps from a stock site. We would start using that to reference and mock up for our client because we didn't want to spend the money on the asset until they actually committed to it, right? And then when they did commit to it, if, if you were sort of new at production, you would do everything again to that brand new asset. If you weren't new, you would figure out how to line it up with the mock-up you had done so you didn't lose all your edit layers and realize that you'd been working on low res and now there was a problem with the math. Eh, what do we do? Okay, this is why we want to integrate stock with our libraries, okay? So I want to I show this a little bit because it's clunky and it's not very um, logical, okay? but it allows you to have a pipeline all the way from your mock-up through licensing through to your final asset, okay? Um, so, 
I'm here in Illustrator right now. Um, you can see I've been playing with some already wood images, but I want to show you guys from scratch. So if I go up here where it says search Adobe stock, which by the way, UI designers, I understand it's very beautiful to use light grays on dark grays, but for the old guy in the room, really hard to read that. So just want to point that out there. So I'm going to just say wood. Okay, let me zoom back out. Oh, thank goodness, the internet is working. Okay, so I did a search right here. It's found some stock images. You can see some that I've already licensed, but maybe I need to look for some other options, right? So I'll go down in here. This is, I'm realizing this is suddenly very Texan. Okay, and there's two buttons in here. You can either license it and save it to your library, or you can download that preview, save preview. So I'm gonna choose that. I get a little spinny, thinky thing right here where it says, I am downloading that for you. Okay, so we'll zoom back out. It says, dark brown scratched wood. Okay, so now we've got that mock-up. Okay, it's in our library. If I drag this in, you guys can see there's a big giant watermark on it, which means we don't own it. Yeah? Okay, I'm gonna turn it, and I'm gonna at least see if I like this concept, okay? So I'm gonna send it to the back. I'm gonna size this down here. We're just gonna rough this in because we're running late on time. Okay, but I'm doing some of my positioning work. I'm figuring out my design concept. Now, what was my rough final size here? 6.5 by 9.25, okay, 6.5 by 9.25. If I now go over to Photoshop, because I really wanna change how that wood looks, right? If I delete this dark background, eh, it's not great, okay? So, let me go over to Photoshop. I'm gonna make a new document. And I'm gonna make this one 6.5 by 9.25. Okay, I would usually enter my resolution for whatever my print vendor told me to use. And from here, I can drag in that comp, okay? So, if I wanna rotate it, if I wanna do anything else, Okay, so I'm just gonna fill that up on the canvas, yeah? Now from here, if I wanna make some edits, that's fine, but do you guys see there's a little cloud icon on the bottom here? So that's linked to our library, and our library is speaking to Adobe Stock. So if I wanna do something like, hey, let's, let's do levels and darken it up, right? If I was to darken this up, come on UI. If I darken this up, right, I'm starting to get some color shifts. This is where I said earlier, maybe you want to use luminosity, so you're only changing the light. It's very subtle, but it doesn't look as red now, okay? So I start darkening this up, so I've got that contrast for the text in the menu design. And maybe, just because we're funky, I want to colorize it. Okay, so I go and press colorize. I'm going to set that blend mode to color. Saturate that a bunch. Dang. Okay. I like my blue wood. <laughs> okay. Now, I've got this, and I'm going to select those three layers. Remember I mentioned earlier this trick about adding a graphic to your library? you got to grab all those layers. So if I grab all those layers, and then I go in here and hit the plus and say add graphic, it adds it as a Photoshop file up here, and we could name it if we want to, but it's got all of those edited, uh, editable layers. So now, I'm not worried about this anymore. I can, I can close this out, it's in my library. I didn't even save it. Go back to Illustrator. If I want to, I can grab this now, right? Here's my outside graphic. And if I want, I can uh, relink this in some way. So if we go to uh, links, doo -doo -doo, there's a button in here. Right across here you can see relink from CC libraries. And if you press that, It'll ask you to select a graphic to relink to, and I want that one. I press a button at the bottom that says relink, and it drops it in here for me, okay? Now, let's just rotate that real quick. Okay. Now, at this point, I might be working my comp for my client and say, yeah, I like it, but we're not really loving the blue. Well, then go back to your comp in libraries, okay? Bring it back, try a different color. And I'm going to do this one because Carrie went bleh. Okay. And I'm going to hit save, go back to my file, 
and it's updated. But I still haven't bought the image, right? So now, if I go back over here to where it says dark brown scratched wood, okay, so I'm in Photoshop, and I right click on it and say license image, it's gonna let me know that I have to use one of my credits. I say okay, client likes it, it downloads over here. Now, hopefully, if the internet gods are kind, we should see that watermark go away. Because remember, we placed that inside the new Photoshop document, okay? Now, it's obviously downloading a much bigger file, so it's, it's thinking a lot. Hey, other presenters, get off the internet. All right, come on, you can do it. I believe in you, internet. It is downloading. It shouldn't be a very big file. Okay, the, the idea here is that we've applied these extra layers and edits, right? We've tinted the color, we've changed the exposure, we've changed the contrast. Hey, look, the watermark went away. So if I save this now, and I go back over here, watermark goes away. So I don't have to buy a high-res image and then reapply all of those edits and controls. They just updated, yeah? So now I've got my file. I can save this out as the PDF, send it to the printer. We can start doing our test from there. So that's a pipe all the way from stock through making a layered asset inside a library without having the separated components, just like our skulls, and then dropping that into our layout component which then automatically updates and we don't have to do the replicate work. Positioning, sizing, adjustments, tone, all of it. Does that make sense? Is that helpful? Yeah. Okay, good, good, all right. Well, I like the energy then. Okay, cool. So, with that being said, we only have a couple of minutes left. Um, I'll take a quick uh, question or two in case anybody has any. And then, uh, and then we can shut down, and I'm sure you guys are ready to go eat and uh, enjoy the outside while still some sunlight. So, any questions? No, yes, maybe? One over here? Yeah, yeah, good question. So the question was, when I added that gradient in the raw editor, would I be able to go back and change that later on? And the answer is absolutely, especially if you were doing it as a smart object. So if I go back to Bridge real quick, let's uh, just take a quick look at that. I'll just do one for now to save time. But if I tell this to open in Camera Raw, and you had this where you did some sort of gradated uh, controller, right? It made it really dark. You want to go taller or smaller. Okay, um, for this demo, I'll just, I'll just say open object, but that metadata saves with it. So if, if you open it in Photoshop, you see you have the smart object here. I have it set in Raw to open as a smart object. This little link at the bottom allows you to set that so it says open in Photoshop as smart object. So that will allow me to retain that. If, um, let's just cancel that for a second. If I had done that, let's close these back here. See how it's got the actual gradient still in the thumbnail? Because they've been applied. If you right click on this and say open in camera raw, that gradient's still there. So grab the gradient tool and it shows you where the drag line was. So now you can click on it, and you can make that smaller or shorter. You could tint it, change the color. But yeah, it's, it's all there because it's just an appearance property. Unless I, yeah, so if you just do that one image, um, I'm not syncing it, right? I don't have all the other images in a film strip over here. So yeah, so if you've got like custom tweaks you need to make, a lot of time I have to sharpen hair in a lot of photos, and they're never in the same position. So I'll do a brush for sharpening, a sync it to all the photos. They won't line up except for the first one but now I can go through each one and just move the mask. And that just kind of gives me a general soft, sharpened area. Yeah, good question. All right, let's, uh, let's see if anybody else has, has one more and then I know we're, we're getting there on time. Yeah, over here. Uh, the question was, could you do this with something that's basically not a cube, right? That's kind of the question here. So yeah, if you um, have something like this and uh, uh, you want to do something like that, instead of doing the extrude and bevel, you would do revolve. And what you would do is you would draw half your bottle, and then this would like wrap around uh, from that. So um, let's see here. See? So it just takes that sphere and wraps it around. And so it, if you just draw the silhouette shape of the bottle, and then you come in here and tell it how much do you want it to wrap, um, you could actually get that to do half a bottle. You could do a full bottle, and you can still map art to it. So this is going to look really weird. Vector grime. 
So see it put the splat over there? And wherever you move it on this map, like it was your label design or something, it'll draw it around the bottle. See how it's wrapping around there? So you can totally do it with any spherical form as long as you know what the silhouette is going to be. Yeah, and it always spins around the axes that you choose. So depending on whether you want it to wrap around the left side or the right side, it just depends on how you draw that silhouette. Yeah. All righty, so I think we've, uh, we've come up on time. I wanted to say thank you for you guys spending some time with me and uh, letting me fly out here from Texas and share some stuff. If you want to follow me online or get those downloads, Life by Pixels on all these sites. Have an excellent Adobe Make. <laughs>